So Tom joined up with uh, Jan Porter, here she comes. And uh, Janet is, uh, so I don't know why you're going to do come on up here. Because you're going to be next. <laughs> So anyway, I went back to D.C. with Tom and I gave him my, this is a credit card, go, go, go. That's what Tom does. And then I met Janet for the first time. Come on, baby, Janet. <laughs> She's a diamond. She's a lady. You know, I believe the unborn child has constitutional rights. And she would probably talk to you about the spark between the I spent a day, and uh, I think my ear, my phone's running. Up. <laughs> and and the life that is created there, um, we can't explain exactly what happens. But line of life begins. It can, it is, and I've always been that way. Somebody say, I believe in pro. I'm pro life. No, I'm alive pro life at conception. And that child has constitutional rights, the rights to liberty. And, and, and basically, at that time, you've got two votes, as far as I'm concerned, between a mom and a child, and we have a right, we have to protect the unborn child, which has the constitutional rights. But also, the law that was being put forth was, um, if you can hear the heart, you can't abort. I don't want to take back from you now. I don't want an abortion at all. And because that unborn child still has constitutional rights. So, and Janet, we walked around Congress, right, and met congressmen, and, and we had 170 votes that we got. And the Tom, the following Tom DeLay is like following the thunder. It's he's moving fast, and there's no standing around chatting, you know, get 15, 20 minutes with the congressman, and off you go when you're following the next congress, and it's just like boom, 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 boom. Anyway, and I'd like you to, uh, Janet, which I have a great admiration for you. Thank you for coming here today. And uh, yeah, I want you to take this phone microphone in. We got a law passed, right? In Iowa, Steve King, which is a good friend, and your good friend, and Tom DeLay. And uh, they, she went to Iowa. And they met with the members of the House and Senate, and lo and behold, the heartbeat bill passed in Iowa. Isn't that great? Give her a hand. It's great. It's mutual. It's mutual. Yes. Am I like I'm over this way? Is that messing you guys up? I just got the look. Like, sorry. This way I can set it down and be like the cool kids, like Bob and Um Where to start? I remember when Barack Obama was inaugurated, a very dark day, and I prayed to God that day, as we've heard from Bob McEwen, just how close we were to mourning the death of the Constitution. And I prayed, God, if you give us another chance, if you give us mercy, I promise. I will, I will take that chance. Mercy. In fact, when you get bummed out, when my, one of my husband's clients says, when I get upset, I just type in snowflake meltdown and watch YouTube on election night. <laughs> nobody expected it. No poll, no political pundit, nobody expected that God would intervene and say, I'll give you another chance as a nation. And he did. You know what I like, Ames, is, is when we sang, they sang your song, This Is My Father's World. That's your favorite hymn. What's, what's great about it is that this is our Father's world, and you want to know what else? He gave it to us. And people don't know that. Uh, let me explain. It says, it says that in Matthew 28, 18, that all authority has been given to me, said Jesus, in heaven and on earth. But then you read in Luke, Luke 10, it says, Behold, I give you all the authority and the power over the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. So, so what happened at the cross is Jesus got the keys to the kingdom back, and he gave them to us. So we don't have to watch fake news, like, just, just imagine David, 
is Stacy the Life. And he was watching CNN before that encounter. Saying, oh, you know, the armor is really big, Goliath is undefeated. Did you see the size of that guy? He is absolutely unbelievable. No one can be. He didn't watch fake news. He went and his eyes were fixed on God and he said to the giant that everyone cowered in fear about it. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dare defy the armies of the living God? You know what? The people who are in the centers of power and influence, in the media, in the legislature, in, 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 in the arts, in the schools, in all of these areas of influence because we have seceded, we have given up the territory. They may occupy, but it doesn't belong to them. And we say, as David did, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dare defy the armies of the living God? We're taking it back because it's ours. All power and all authority that was given to Jesus, he gave it to us. And you know what's great about this? A lot of people say, well, I don't know, can we, can we take back our country with just the people that Ames Court writes barn here? Can we, can we do that? You know what? I have great hope that we can. Because you want to know something? It's never taken a huge majority to win anything. It says in Second Chronicles, you know, the, you know the, the, the checklist. He said, if my people, if just God's people... Humble themselves and pray and seek his face. And here's the one that everybody forgets about. Turn from their wicked ways. If we do what God says, then God will do what he says. And that is to hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and he'll heal our land. You know the Revolutionary War, it was inspiring to hear, where is Bob? It's inspiring to hear the words of the Star Spangled Banner and all that was happening. And, and, and what I, I, I love is, is, is when I talk to David Barton, he said, you know what, only 25% of America was actually in favor of the revolution at the time. Only 7 to 8 percent were actually actively involved. 7 to 8 percent of this very small ragtag team that, that, that joined together to make America. I wasn't planning on saying this, but I'm just going to tell you that there was a flag. Many of you don't know. I, I, I had some boy toy friends who were daughters of the American Revolution. How lovely. Okay. Did a family tree. Turns out so hot. I'm related to Benjamin Franklin and Betsy Ross, and even though I love this flag and I pledge allegiance to it, do you know this is not our nation's first flag? Do you know this was the first one? How many saw a tea party meetings? They're, they're popping up in prayer rooms. It's, it's the white flag that says an appeal to heaven with a, with a Christmas tree on it. Have you seen this? How many have seen this thing? I wish I would have brought one to show you. That was what George Washington commissioned to fly over our first Navy ships. Yep. Because it was based on the writings of John Locke. Why? Because when you don't know what else to do, when you're facing the most powerful nation on earth and you don't have a chance, in, 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 in earthly terms, you don't have a chance to win, what do they do? They made an appeal to heaven. And that's what the flag represented. It flew over our first Navy ships. And you know what? They captured some British ships at that time, gathered the ammunition, the supplies, and what they needed to help win the Revolutionary War, all because they made an appeal to heaven. We shouldn't even be a country right now, except that our founders made an appeal to heaven. We uh, shouldn't have won, except that it doesn't take a majority. That we gathered together and we cried out to our God, and God heard our prayer, and that's why we are here, one nation under God. And so, when I made that prayer, and I, I realized that, 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 that God answered it, that really, people say, oh, Janet, you have great faith. Do you know what faith is? Faith is just acting like the Word of God is true. They can really believe what it says. That's what faith is, acting like the Word of God is true. And what I want to tell you today is whatever God has put on your heart, I'm not saying play defense. I'm sick of defense. Where you always seem to do, ah, there it is. God bless you. Thank you. Get over here for a picture. Hold on a second. Apparently somebody snapped this. This is awesome. I got a patron with our first flag. I want to buy this, this shirt from you. Appeal to Heaven, the official prayer team. This is our first flag right here. This is why we're a nation. Thank you very much. I don't know what I was going to say. Something about America. Something about our country. Yeah, the, 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 the where you go in life is, is based on what you pray. My message to you today is to pray big. Because the transcript of your prayer becomes the script of your life. Pray big. And so, after I prayed about... Uh, promising God that I'm going to take whatever freedom you give me, God, if you give us another chance. And so we moved from, from the sunshine state of Florida back to Ohio to be with family. And my husband said to me, he knew we had been involved in the pro-life movement, he said to me these words, which I wish I would have had the faith to believe at the moment he said it, but he said to me, Janet, 
why don't you outlaw abortion while you're here? I'm only on a few minutes, I can knock that out, you know, I'm sure I laughed at him, like that seems a little big, it seems a little bit too big. If what you're planning to do is not too big, then it's, it's, it's the wrong thing. Because it's not, about, it's not about us. By the way, I was the kid who was afraid to give a speech in class. All right, I remember when I was uh, one of the keynotes at, a, at an event uh, in Cleveland for their memorial, they had a big 2,000 people showing up, and, and I was the keynote because I think they were out of money to invite the Henry Hydes and the Dr. Wilkies and all the people. And, and one woman who was, saw me backstage, and she said to me, I went through speakers training with you. I have to tell you, I'm really surprised that you ended up being our spokesman. Thank, thank you. Because it's going to surprise you. I used to like get all teary-eyed and cry and stuff like that back when I was, you know, not a good speaker. I do that now. It's not, still not a good speaker is the whole point. But, but uh, God uses anybody. He uses the weak to show himself strong. He uses the foolish things to confound the wise. This is who we serve, and it's not about us. It's not about our talent. It's not our ability. The only ability you need to serve God, a priest friend of mine told me, the only ability you need to serve God is availability. So when my husband said to me, why don't you outlaw abortion while you're here, I, I, originally I thought that's too big. But it's not about me. It's about the one who can do it. The God of the impossible. My home state is Ohio. The motto of my state is the motto of my life. With God, all things are possible. So in November of 2010, uh, I was at the funeral of a friend I used to work for at, 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 in the Right to Life movement. And I, and, and I just said, you know what, here's this guy who worked his whole life. He never got to see what he worked for. And at that moment, I said, you know what? We need to do this. We need to finish this. We need to do it. We need to do it now. And I turned to a friend and said, we can't rescue every child just yet. Then we're going to, we've got to get them, as many as we can. And I said, how about from the time their hearts begin to beat? Those in the pro life movement, you know, the heart begins to beat at 18 days. Someone said, well, you know, you have to at least be able to detect it when you can hear the heartbeats. And so we said, all right, all right, we'll draft a bill. I assembled a team of about 25 attorneys, put them on a conference call, and said, let's draft a bill. We call it the heartbeat bill. Oh, cool. So the motto of the bill is, if a heartbeat is detected, the baby is protected. That's the bill. And it says, we're going to provide a scientific solution to the issue of abortion. We're going to protect them from conception. Don't be mistaken. Don't mistake me about that. But at least... At least we can all agree on, on the universally recognized indicator of life, a human heartbeat. There is not a hospital in America or around the world that doesn't acknowledge the heartbeat. If there is a heartbeat, there is life. Those heart monitors aren't there for decoration. You know, if somebody fell on the ground right here, we wouldn't just automatically have a funeral. No, no, we would check for a pulse because a pulse is an indicator of life universally recognized. So why would we ignore it in the very young? So we did a poll. We did a George Barna poll. And it turns out, in America, I've never seen this in all my years. I've been in the movement more than 40 years now. It started really young. And, and one of the things I found, I've never seen a bill that protects this many babies have this much support. Seven out of ten in America said that if a doctor is able to detect the heartbeat of an unborn baby, that baby should be legally protected. Seven out of ten across the board. 86% of Republicans, and I'm glad you're sitting down, 55% of Democrats favor the heartbeat bill becoming law as well. That's an amazing thing. So we introduced the bill in Ohio in 2011 during Valentine's week. And uh, people say, oh, you're so creative. Well, you know, I just created the creator. He gives you creative ideas. And on the day that we introduced the bill, I had 5,000 red heart helium balloons. We filled up the press conference room with balloons, floor to ceiling all around the room, and then we delivered them to the members of the House of Representatives in the state. And we, uh, we, we, we had hearings, here's a fun thing, we did this in Congress, and I'll tell you in a second, but we brought in, beginning in Ohio, the youngest to ever testify in the state house and in Congress. We brought in an unborn baby by, via ultrasound. Pro boards went crazy, you wouldn't believe this. Oh, Janet, your circuit act, her gimmicks, this is ridiculous. They put the camera on me, and I said, isn't it sad that to defend your position, you have to deny science? That's sad. To run from technology to support your position. And that little baby in the hearing room ended up saving a life. And in the Senate, when we tried to do the same thing in the Senate committee, oh, we don't do that in the Senate. No, we're, you know, we don't, we won't allow that. So that's all right. You still allow video testimony, right? 
Well, yeah, we, we allow video testimony. So we play a little nine-week-old baby, baby Haley's testimony from the house. She was nine weeks old in the womb. We played it in the Senate. But some time had lapsed between the House and the Senate hearings in 2000, uh, now 2012. And so what happened was we played the, the, the video for the Senate and we said the House heard her heart. But in comes walking the Senator with the baby in his arms and says the Senate sees her face. This is the baby that testified in the House that you now get to see. And so we did that in Congress. We, had a, we have now a congressional version of the bill, and I know I'm jumping ahead of myself, but it, we did the same. We brought in an 18-week baby, baby Lincoln, I believe is going to be used to emancipate this generation. He was there, and let me tell you, you know how the hearing rooms are. You see all the, the protesters and the people who are obnoxious trying to, you know, trying to disrupt things. Well, well they were all there. And, uh, and we showed baby Lincoln there in the ultrasound in the U.S. Congress Judiciary Committee. And there was baby Lincoln, and as we see the heartbeat, and the, and the committee is looking and hearing the heartbeat, the room was silent. One of the protesters who was there, who had been disrupted just moments earlier, was seen wiping tears away from her eyes. And it, it occurs to me now, that if this baby's heartbeat can reach even the hardest of hearts, it's going to change America. It's going to open the heart to life again. We now have, and I'll tell you how this whole thing came about, we were starting to, 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 to lobby. Ames will tell you, we're, we're running up and down and, and knocking on doors and trying to talk people into what they don't want to do. And, 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 and I was praying one day on the phone, and remember, the transcript of your prayers becomes the script of your life. I'm on a conference call with two other people from our team, and I said, God, we need help. We need help. Who are we, who are we forgetting about that we know? Who are we forgetting about that, 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 that could help us? And it was like somebody whispered the thought in my, my mind, Tom DeLay. And I called Tom DeLay. And Tom said yes. And he came with us and doors swung open. And, 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 and people were running across the room. Tom, we miss you. Tom, we miss you. You know what happened. Tom got run out of, of Congress because of the left. And I told him what I want to tell you. Is that if you want to know, what you want to be encouraged of what God's going to do, go look and see what the enemy says about you. The enemy despised Tom DeLay. Because Tom DeLay was one of the most powerful people in this country. And what he did is when he went around and talked to these members of Congress, he said, I leave Congress with one regret. My biggest regret in leaving Congress is that I didn't finish the job. I didn't end abortion. I got talked in by the establishment that it can't be done. It's too soon. It's not the right time. Really? Because we've been killing kids for 45 years. We've got a death toll of 60 million. If not now, when? If not us, who? This is where we are right now, in a position that we have the Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican in the White House. We've got a new justice on the brink of being the majority vote in the court, which is why they're all going ballistic. But you want to know something? If we don't do this now, then, then we don't deserve, we don't deserve the, the, the chance that God's given us. We've got to make good on, on our, our promises and our prayers. This is where we are. By the way, uh, What's happening in this, this, this situation is the enemy attacks on I was, by the way, running Senate candidates against the Senate who in Ohio were blocking us for six years. And so I just started recruiting candidates. Will you run for Senate? Will you run for Senate? We need you to file. We're in the primary. And we, we, we didn't win in some of those, those, in those races, but we cost them a lot of money. So in 2016, uh, I couldn't find anybody to run in the race, in the, in the district where I lived. So I had to put my faith to action. I went down and I, I filed a run for the state senate against the now president of the state senate. And uh, they did two polls. And they both, both polls they did showed that we were dead even, that I was running dead even in the opinion polls with the president of the senate. And so they spent a lot, 1.3 million I'm told. It was every station, every television station, every radio station, Pandora, 20, I think it was like 27 mailings saying that I was the pro abort and I was the liberal and I was the one who was the one you need to defeat. And, and so I got a little taste of, of, of some of what Judge Kavanaugh and, and, and Judge Moore, short of the, uh, the, the uh, accusations of, of sexual misconduct. And, and incidentally, this is, this is their playbook. They attack 
those who dare make a stand for righteousness. And I, I remember I, I was one of the spokespeople for Judge Roy Moore. He was being Judge Kavanaugh, or Judge Kavanaugh is being Judge Moore. This is what they do. And if they're allowed to get away with it, they will. By the way, I just got a subpoena three days ago uh, saying that I've got to appear in a courthouse because one of the accusers is, su is countersuing. All right. You know what? When we said we're going to stand for freedom, we're going to stand for it no matter what the, no matter what the cost. And what we need to do is, is do that. Is we need to stand. So, all right, so Tom DeLay is, is opening doors. We're now at 174 co-sponsors of the federal heartbeat bill, more than any other pro-life bill in Congress. And he says, Jan, you know, I can only get a meeting. We're trying to get a meeting with the vice president. He said, I only got in with the policy advisor. Would that be okay? I said, sure, yeah, let's meet with the policy advisor, the vice president. We have a very lovely meeting. We give him the information. He handed him a letter of 120 leaders who are calling for a vote of the federal heartbeat bill. And they said, well, which way would you like to leave the White House? I said, how about the scenic routes? <laughs> and so we left the White House. There's Ivanka, there's all the people. And uh, who do we run into but Vice President Mike Pence, who runs across the room to hug Tom DeLay. Tommy, how are you? This is a divine appointment. The Vice President said, I love, love, love the heartbeat bill. And I will hand deliver this, this letter to President Trump's desk myself. And so what we're seeing is doors are swinging open because we were able to step out. <laughs> the bill is now, uh, it was passed in Arkansas in 2013, passed in, in North Dakota the same year. It passed Ohio in 16, was heartlessly vetoed by John Kasich, who can never call himself a pro-lifer again. Uh, and as you've heard from Ames, also in Iowa, but we believe it needs to be passed there. And so I was, I was at the Capitol Hill Club a week, two weeks ago, and um, I believe God orders our steps. My husband whispers over to me and says, hey, Jan, I, I know why Secret Service was outside. He says, there's Speaker Paul Ryan having dinner in the corner. And so I'm not very shy, I used to be, but I walked over to the room and I took him one of these things that's called, they, they have sort of like, it's sort of like trading cards, it's sort of like baseball cards, but they all trade these, these challenge coins. It's kind of a military thing, military, you guys know this. But in Congress they trade and so we made our own challenge coin. It's called the Heartbeat Bill Hero Coin. And on the back it has a picture of a baby. It says the heartbeat's detected, the baby's protected. And so I have these coins made and we give it to the, the people who co-sponsor the bill. And I walked over to Paul Ryan's table and I set it down on the table like this. And he says, what's this? I said, this is you. If a heartbeat bill hero, if you will bring the bill to a vote. And he peddled about, oh, I know all about that bill. I know all about that bill. And he's hiding behind the establishment that doesn't want it done. I said, you can actually be the guy that ends abortion, keeps those pro-life promises you've been made. Before you leave, you have a chance to be the one. And uh, we're praying that, that he takes that chance. I also gave it to, uh, to Chairman Bob Goodlatte, Chairman also is retiring, who also has the ability to bring this to a vote in the Judiciary Committee. I don't know who's going to be the one to do it, but I know we're going to keep pounding on the door until someone does, and I believe it's going to happen, if not this session, very, very soon. And there's, there's two people I want to call for, and Ames, if you come here for a second, and also Bob McEwen, are you still here? Did Bob leave? There you are. Here, Bob. I have something for you both. There are two people who are very instrumental in, in appearance uh, who are part of this. Not only did Ames make the rounds uh, uh, with us uh, more than once, uh, meeting after meeting after meeting, uh, when we were in over our heads with the, Bob, you were there at the Capitol Hill Club, we had, I think there were, I'm trying to remember, like 100, 114 people, RSVP, they'd come to the Capitol Hill Club for dinner, and uh, I got stuck with the bill. A lot of people didn't come and eat, but... Uh, but, but Ames stepped up and said, you know what, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to pay half that bill for you. And I just want to say uh, to both of you, and, and Bobby McEwen, when we were in Ohio and the bill was on the brink of passing, it just passed the House, remember 2000, September was 2011, we filled up the State House on, a, I think it was a Tuesday afternoon. We used every chair they had, and we had more people than the, than the atrium has ever held. We had to have overflow outside, with the video outside, and Bob McEwen was one of the people in the early days, before anybody knew about this bill, he stood with us and he stood strong to make sure that if a heartbeat is detected, the baby is protected. And I would like to present you with a heartbeat bill hero coin. 
Bob McEwen. We thank you. You are a truly Thank you for being there, being part of the Bureau, lobbying with us to see that the killing comes to an end. God bless you. We're not done. Because you know what we're going to do? We're going to abortion. That's what we're going to do. By the way, Gethin, sorry. Here you go. This is, this is, and this is, it's got a little stand in there and uh, all of that. I'm very grateful. Um, so, I'm very grateful. What I tell Steve King and, and the other members is, is I remember sitting in the, in, in, uh, in the, in the Capitol Hill, we were up to, uh, I think we were up to like 57 co-sponsors, 58. Uh, no, it might have been, no, I think we were up to 100 and something, 120, something like this. And one of the girls we work with uh, is part of Eagle Forum, uh, Rebecca Gantner. And I, she said, how many co-sponsors are we up to? We're now up to 174, but at that time it was like, I don't know, might have been 58 or 59. She just looked at me and said what I've been saying to everybody every step of the way. Wow. We're going to end abortion. That's right. We're going to end it. We're going to end it. Because I'm sick of talking about it. I'm sick of marching about it. I'm sick of protesting about it. It's time that we just end it. You know, the, the, the Republicans right now, we're still funding Planned Parenthood. You know what? We're talking about something better than defunding Planned Parenthood. How about we put them out of business entirely? And that's what this bill is doing. So, I know we don't have time for questions, but I want to tell you one other cool thing that's going on right now. Um, I, it's not just limited to one thing. And it's not just limited to our gifts and our abilities. That we serve the God of the impossible, and either he is who he claims to be, or he isn't. So I want you to think about the centers of power and influence, the mountains of influence that are in this country, and let's just take them back. And so I, 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 I'll just tell you, uh, I, I was, I was kind of bummed out one day. I was trying to make a movie. Because 25 years ago, I said to somebody, hey, you know what, 25 years ago, I'm going to write a sitcom. And someone from Hollywood came and said, well, that's impossible. Now, the Janet Porter of today might say to them what I should have said, but this time I, I didn't listen. But I, I should have said, oh, yeah? Watch the impossible bow the knee to the name of Jesus. That's what I should have said. But instead, I said, oh, it's impossible. And I said, oh, yeah, it'd be easier for you to make a movie. I said, okay, then I'll make a movie. For 20 years, I've been trying to make this movie about how we passed the nation's first ban on partial birth abortion. The twist, here's the hook. Imagine, imagine Ann Coulter dating the son of Nancy Pelosi at the state level. That's kind of what it was. I actually dated the son of the woman who took over the committee and killed our, 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 the nation's first ban on partial birth abortion. We had to do a discharge petition. We pulled it out of committee and, and we, we, we took it up all the way to the Supreme Court. 30 states followed us. Congress passed it four times, vetoed twice by Clinton, signed twice by Bush. It all started with a heart with a, with a bill that they said was impossible with the bill that was killed by my boyfriend's mother. Uh, that's, that's the movie I wanted to make. And so I made this trailer, and, and, and that's another story. We, we put it out there, and it helped us get the bill over, in, in, over the finish line in Ohio. But what happened was, the gentleman who said to me, I'm going to give you $2 million to make the movie, and he wanted me to raise $2 million more to make my movie, but I don't know any millionaires, so I don't blame him. He gave the money away. So here I am one day, this was uh, March of this year, and I'm kind of bummed. My bill is being blocked by establishment groups like people like Right to Life that call themselves pro-life that are blocking the most protective pro-life bill. By the way, it's, oh, I heard the groan. It's, believe me, I've been having that groan for eight years now that we've been pushing through this. By the way, Ohio Right to Life, I used to be the legislative director of Ohio Right to Life back when they were pro-life. Dr. Wilkie, who was the founder of Right to Life, left the organization he founded to join our team to, to work for the heartbeat bill in the state and, and, and beyond. He's, it's, it's just astounding that, that you've heard of fake news. Well, there, there's a thing called fake pro-life group. Uh, you cannot be a legitimate pro-life group and call for a veto of the nation's most protective pro-life bill, and that's what Ohio Right to Life did. When we finally got the bill through in 2016 in Ohio, Ohio Right to Life told John Casey, we told the bill, we'll give you cover. And that's what they did. Um, so, so, it's been a battle. But, but I have never, as Bob said, I've never been more hopeful because we have been given a chance. All that God needs is for people to step out and take it. So, all right, so here I am. I'm discouraged. This is March of this year. I lost my $2 million, my dream of making my movie. My bill's being stalled. And I'd like to say that I, I turned to the word, I 
got on some good Christian programming. No, I was so desperate for need of a, of a laugh that I actually turned, I binge watched sitcoms. It's embarrassing. I saw, I don't know, four or five Big Bang Theories till I got sick to my stomach and I said, I can't take this anymore. And I went up and I dusted off my sitcom script from 25 years ago. And I rewrote it. And I called the investor and he said he had some seed money. I said, well, $100,000 isn't enough for a movie, but it is enough for a sitcom pilot. And he said, yes. And last month, we shot a sitcom pilot called What's a Girl to Do? It's based on uh, one of my books. This is the one that I didn't want to write. Uh, it's called What's a Girl to Do While Waiting for Mr. Right. I, I told him I don't write books on dating. I do the cultural issues. I do the controversy, right? But this is the book that, uh, that I wrote, and this is what the, uh, the screenplays, or the, the sitcoms based on. We have a trailer if you guys want to see it. Um, can, we, can we go ahead and see if we can play that? Um, it's, it's a little longer than a trailer, but it's, it's, it's got to be behind you, so you all got to kind of turn around. And it's, 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 again, this is the very first rough draft. You're the first group to see this in America. Don't post this anywhere. <laughs> to communicate the truths of God's word, the issues of the day, in, in a way that people will actually watch it. And uh, so we're going to be uh, talking, Netflix has been going around telling everybody they want Christian content, they want Christian content, we're going to offer it to them. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how long we'll be able to keep it on there, because eventually we're going to be offering, uh, there'll be such a thing as like ex-homosexual characters, and uh, you know, the second episode deals with the life issue, third episode deals with the liberty issue, and, and we're going to get the truth out, just what the enemies used for years. I mean, you look at Friends, they made sleeping around the norm, you look at what happened with, with Will and Grace, I mean, homosexuality, that, you know, uh, accepted and promoted, and, and uh, Roseanne, I mean, 28 million people, they're running the show without her, because everybody wants a, a piece of that pie, so uh, just so pray for this, this is one of the efforts we're doing, I want to open it up for questions, I'm told I have a few minutes to ask for questions, but I want to say this, it doesn't take a, a gifting or a talent, it takes faith in the God of the impossible. We can step out and we can do what he says we're able to do, and that is occupy until he comes. We're going to end abortion. We're going to take our country back. And we're going to get back to every every corner of the culture, and we're going to we're going to proclaim the gospel, and we're going to speak the truth. And that's what we're here to do. I'll take a question or two. Y'all have one? Anybody? It can be on the Harvey Bill or this one. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, have you thought of uh, Have you thought of uh, calling One American News to show that? Yeah, I haven't done that yet. And by the way, One American News is awesome. They did. They were down there when we were in Alabama, uh, standing with the righteous Judge Moore, um, and and that's that's a great alternative. But we haven't told this to anybody. And I encourage you, don't post it anywhere. Don't tell anybody about it yet, because um, you know what I told Tom Delay is, if you want to be encouraged, go see what your enemy says about you. When I was running for the state senate, they were blasting me and all of this, and, and right wing watch was writing a story, and I went back, and I just I, just because of all the hit that I was taking, I went and looked. Turns out that I am, this encouraged me. I was losing, we tried it again, we introduced the bill a third time, I'm still losing, I run against the Senate, I'm getting, you know, blasted and bombarded, and it turns out that I am the number two most watched woman on Right Wing Watch. Michelle Bachman, and then me, and uh, and that's just because I've been doing it a really long time, but but the, uh, the deal is, is they don't like me, and what I do, and I think they'd start doing a negative, they'd start cavanaughing us if, if we, before we get this, this thing out. So I want to get a signed contract and then tell the world. So thank you. I sure appreciate that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. We're getting a mic to you. Usually what happens in a campaign is, excuse me, can I hold it? Okay. Yeah, I can hold it. So usually what happens in a campaign is after the campaign, when a candidate like yourself or any conservative, they are ripped up and down. And I've never seen a situation yet where what the new candidate actually did that ripped on a conservative. Do you think that there's a possibility to come up with something, a sitcom or something to address that issue? Where the new candidate, uh Say it again. Where, where, when the, the candidate who replaces the conservative, who has lied through the primary, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and those things are exposed in some kind of Can I tell you? This is the great thing. If the idea is yours, you have the freedom to do it. It takes a camera. Look how easy it is to get a camera today. They're very, very cheap now. And you could, you could whatever God put in your heart to do, 
I believe that when we get this out there, and I believe what we're, we're praying that we get non-exclusive rights so we get it on other networks too, as well as Netflix, that, that, that we will blaze the trail for others to follow and use this platform to advance the kingdom. And so I say do that. I'm going to handle some of those issues because I live them, but, but, but you can too. That's my message to you. And uh, my time running up. We want to break Bob up here too. No, no, no. Get some questions. Uh, Bob, if you could come on up too. We're going to do a double Q&A here. So Bob McEwen, ask Bob questions of Bob as well. He's very well informed. I understand he sees the president many times a year, like 20, 30 times, right? Or amplified a little bit from there. Okay. And you're going to bring up the heartbeat bill next yeah. meeting, right, Bob? You want to sit down? <laughs> I'm going to sit down. Well, sit down. Sit down. Anybody need to stand up? If you That's need to stand up, please feel free to stand up. While we're waiting, this is somebody's hat. Right. You left it in the meeting room? The Trump hat? You should no, it says here. U.S. veteran of the U.S. Air Force. Ah. Air Force, okay. We're in Navy, fly Navy. Right? All right. Um, you know, I think I just want to say something that just comes to mind. Um, um, you know, uh, Black Hawk Down, General Jerry Boink. He said, God loves a soldier. He loves courage. I think that's the one thing we, we can't do. You, you, you gotta move forward. You gotta you, you need to have courage. So God's gonna bless us who have courage. So anyway, I'm gonna get from this moment or let you feel you folks ask the questions from these two these one two wonderful the, people. One of the plaques I gave to uh, Don Wildman and to <coughs> Phyllis Schlafly before she passed away is that America is the land of the free because of the brave. Uh, and that's where we are. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. Could you address uh, the different levels? My understanding is that we have the federal level, but even if we're successful on the federal level, it'll probably go back to the states, and so we have a state level, and it's a little difficult for us in the state of Oregon to be very optimistic at this point. So if you could address the different levels. Regarding the heartbeat bill? Yes. Thank you. Sure. At the state level, um, you, you will affect, obviously, the children in your state. What I would tell people of Oregon, and the same thing I told people of New York and California, introduce a heartbeat bill, even if your legislature is evil and your chances of getting through are, are very slim. Why? Because just the publicity. I'll tell you the story. In Ohio, when we brought in the youngest to testify, this little baby Haley, nine weeks old in Ohio, and it was on all the news. What was great is every time they talked about the bill, they showed that baby on the ultrasound with the heartbeat, because that was their B-roll every time they talked about it. You know, the bill's held up a committee, there's the, there's the baby. And so a woman came up to me, she called herself pro-choice. She was a staffer, and she came up to me and said, Janet, I, I have to tell you, she was so distraught. She introduced herself and she said, I had a friend and she asked me to drive her to the abortion mill. She didn't use the word mill, I do, but she said, she asked me to drive her to the abortion clinic. And I, I had to tell her no, because I heard about this heartbeat of the baby. And two weeks later or so, she came up to me, smiling, beaming, running up and hugging. She said she canceled the appointment. And about, I don't know, eight months later or so, she showed me the picture on Facebook, posted of this beautiful little baby boy, baby Aiden, was saved before the bill ever got through the House of Representatives. You can do that in Oregon. And at, at the federal level, when we pass this, uh, this will protect every child whose heartbeat can be detected. Of course, it's, it's deemed for the Supreme Court. And make no mistake, this is a finely crafted arrow to pierce the heart of Roe versus Wade. That the general deal, and I'll, I'll shut up after I tell you this, is what the Eighth Circuit said. That we've got a more Eighth Circuit that reviewed the Arkansas and North Dakota heartbeat laws. They looked at it and said, the states should be the ones doing this court. They should be the ones. And they said they've got a more consistent and certain marker than the one the court is using of viability. See, what now the court has said, states, Congress, you're allowed to pass protection, le protective legislation as long as there is a likelihood of survival to live birth. That's what we're allowed to do now, says the court. Well, the, the measure they're using right now is viability, which is a lousy measure. It changes with technology, changes with medical advances. But you know what? We've got a better marker, more certain and consistent, as the, as the Eighth Circuit says, that says if you actually have a heartbeat, a detectable heartbeat in an unborn child, there's almost a certainty, 95% likelihood, that child will survive to live birth. 
So even if the court doesn't change its, its jurisprudence, doesn't change its, its opinion on when we're allowed to, we simply say, you say we're allowed to protect life when there's a likelihood of survival on live birth? We got a better marker. It's more scientific, more consistent, more certain. And we suddenly move the marker from miles away uh, from conception, from viability, we move it inches away to heartbeat. And what the pro boards did, they came in and testified, and they said, this is going to outlaw all abortions. And I sat there silently nodding on the inside saying, yeah, you know what? The abortion industry, they're in it for money, and they're probably not going to stay open for a fraction of their business. Because when we, when we protect babies whose heartbeats can be detected, we're going to protect them all. Because also technology is getting better and better, and we're going to protect more and more just by hearing that baby's heartbeat because we know it begins to beat as early as 18 days. Sorry, I, I dominated that whole question. Let's get another one for Bob. <laughs> question. How about one for Bob? Yeah, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> How about shutting up, kid? Uh, I was attending a naturalization ceremony for 50 new citizens, and I was struck by a pamphlet that the uh, naturalization people distributed, and it declares that the Declaration of Independence is the charter of our nation. The Constitution is merely the bylaws, our operational manual. Why is not that focused on more in the discussion? That's a good, it's a very good question. The two okay. It says so. In government, uh, I'm glad to hear that. The declaration is the charter. Yeah, that's uh, very good. And, and, and just a, one more thing is for those that, that life is not really their big thing, uh, let me just respond to that just for a moment uh, as to why life is critical. America is the only nation on earth that says we hold these truths to be self evident, which is a gracious Jeffersonian way of saying. Any idiot ought to understand this. This is self-evident. So you're going to be blind, deaf, and dumb. You ought to be able to see that all men are created equal. And then we're the only nation that protects life. And God blesses that. Life comes from God. And, and when Moses was in a position of authority, uh, he was being worn, at, worn down. And, and his, his father-in-law, uh, Jethro, talked to him. And, and so what do we do? God gave him three instructions. Three instructions. He said, you've got to put people in charge of thousands of times. Have federal, state, and local government, and you're going to look for these three criteria. Number one, that they believe in God. There's only two options. Either you believe you're God, or you believe He's God. Those are the only two options. There's only two worldviews. Either you believe that man created God, or you believe God created man. You go to the philosophy section of any bookstore, any library, you take down by page five, you can tell which one of those two are. Our founders knew which one it was. There was God. Moses was instructed, those that fear God, Number two, lovers of truth. Now, what is that? What is the significance of truth? Let me just take a moment on it. I can say this room is 45 feet wide. You can say it's 50. You can say it's 35. Everybody, please just punch until somebody comes in and measures it. And when they measure it, that measurement is truth. Everything else is just opinion. But here's what truth does. Truth reveals error. So error hates truth. So I can say four times during the course that I'm talking, this room is 45 feet wide. And a little girl, three feet tall, weighing 50 pounds, it doesn't make any difference about the subject, that she can come in and measure it and find out it's 38 feet, and everybody in the room knows that what I said was wrong. Therefore, error hates truth. That's why you can't have a conservative speak on a college campus, because one of them, it will reveal the error. So, number one, error overcomes... Error does not fear truth because truth overcomes error. Let me explain. There was a statement that George Bush had made that somehow or another the Al Qaeda was no longer a threat. And so I, uh, I, I thought, well, that's a strange thing. They immediately cut to the Bill Pan, the foreign minister of France, and said, I don't know what the president is talking about. They went to all these on the evening news that it led the story. But George Bush said that. That Al Qaeda is no longer a threat. It was on every newspaper and all the rest. And the next morning, one newspaper, the one that you heard from in Washington, one newspaper did one thing. They put a little brock and they said this. Do you remember when George Bush went into war in Iraq? He had the 52 deck of cards and he had the 52 leaders of Al Qaeda on the 52 deck of cards. And what happened was that after a press conference, they 
I shouted at the president and said, how's your deck of cards coming? And he stopped. And he turned around and he said, well, 42 of them, of the leaders of Al-Qaeda, are either dead or incarcerated. Either way, they are no longer a threat. The Washington Times took that and then it had underneath it what the New York Times said, in which it said this. President Bush said, the leaders of Al-Qaeda, dot, 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 no longer a threat. Now, that's what Reuters reported, AP, CBS, NBC, British, every newspaper in the world did it. But truth overcomes error. And when the New York Times did that, Fox began to put it on its 15-minute loop. Rush Limbaugh felt obligated to talk about it for about three hours. And in the course of about 24 hours, that one newspaper, truth overcomes error. Therefore, error hates truth. That's why you can't have a, a, one conservative on a college campus. That's why I can pray at inaugural in the name of Eagle Feathers and Mother Earth and anything, and nobody cares. But if you pray in the name of Jesus Christ, all hell will break loose. Why? Because I am truth, and error cannot tolerate truth. And so they're instructed to do things, those who believe in God, lovers of truth, and number three, I, the Lord is going to give you five books. He's given you only one sentence, the three things to look for in a leader. And the third one is haters of covetousness. You know what a synonym for covetousness is? Socialism. Or not what free enterprise, where you make corn and you make wheat and you make cars. You make, but socialism is where I take what you have. I covet what you have. Those are the three things you're not supposed to do. Let's go back to God and to life. You are old enough to remember they used to have a thing called the, the Book of the Month Club. They used to advertise it all the time. And one of the things they said, if you signed up, you could get the 14th volume of the History of Civilization by Will and Ariel Durant. And, and I did, and Jack Kemp did. Jack Kemp had all his children read it. And, and I remember they were being interviewed. They're dead now, but the two of them had spent their entire life studying the History of Civilization. And they were, they were being interviewed and asked, what is, a, what is a consistency in the collapse of the various cultures that you study, the civilizations, the, the Peloponnesians? Is there a similarity to all of those? And they started to both talk at the same time. They said there's two things. Number one is a loss of respect for human life. The Peloponnesians had virgin sacrifices, and the Aztecs had infant sacrifices, and the Romans had gladiators. A loss of respect for human life and... The acceptance of sexual perversion as normal. Those were the final two steps in the collapse of a culture. So our founders said, we hold these truths, that life, and that's what made America what it was. That our rights came from God, and it gave us life. Now, our opponents have fought to get rid of liberty. They did that for 150 years. We had to fight a war to get that. But now they're dead set on doing away with life. That's what makes America unique. A Jew knows that he can be chased from around the globe, but if he could just get under the canopy of protection of the American flag, that they would protect it because Americans respect life. And that's what God has honored. And that's what the fight is all about. Final conclusion is this on how to vote. For those of you in this room say, well, you know, this is kind of, there's lots of things going on. There's taxes and there's foreign trade and all that. And you're standing up here talking about life. Let me just tell you this. Life and liberty. Any politician that will take innocent life will not hesitate to take your liberty. A person that will kill will not hesitate to tell you what kind of bathroom, what kind of toilet you can have, what kind of light bulbs you can use, what kind of straws you can suck through. They'll take every other sort of liberty. So if you don't know who to vote for, just very simply, life is the criteria. No one, anyone who will take innocent life will obviously take your liberty. Including would be all of this. It, well, one couple in five, actually it's closer to 23%, it's between one couple in five and one couple in four, cannot conceive. And in this idea of, of life, that we are taking innocent babies and what we've done, you say, well, these people, they can't afford to do it, and I'm not real sure, maybe, maybe it would be best if we just killed them. That's, that's Satan has that. But let me just tell you, there are thousands and thousands we give anything to have a child. They'll crawl over cut glass. They'll jeopardize our homes. They'll go through all kinds of, they'll go to form. They'll do everything humanly possible. And in this fight, and so I'll conclude with something that we never, ever talked about, ever. And that is that the Lord blessed my wife and me with four 
children, the love of my life, they didn't see makes it all work, and, and we never even talk about it, never even think about it, and this is the first time I ever talked about it publicly. It doesn't matter anymore because we're all in their 30s, but we never did it when they were young, and that is that they came to the miracle of adoption. And we were at Louise Gore, who was a prominent political leader in Maryland. We were at her home one day, and all of us were there, and, uh, and uh, we were sitting with, with Justice Blackman, who had written the Roe v. Wade decision, as we now know, that was not really his idea. It was his wife and his daughters that beat on him forever, and eventually they held it for two terms, and so they got enough votes, and, and this evil thing was done, and it has to be undone. The four children that the Lord blessed us with, we had four in 38 months. It's sort of like the rat going through the pipeline. You just had a, they're big wheels and then bicycles and then cars from college. And, and now it's a wonderful time. But nevertheless, they were there. And Dan Coyle's children were, were sort of overseeing them. They're all three and four and five. And they were just as cute as could be, just dressed in their little sailor outfits as my wife always did. And, and Justice Blackman said, you know, your children are just so gorgeous. They're just, they're just look at that. And, and every, all the members of Congress and senators were all sort of sitting around here. It was after lunch, and we were sitting on this veranda looking at these gorgeous, gorgeous children. And I'm sitting there thinking, should I or shouldn't I? <laughs> and I finally said, you know, Justice, you're exactly right. You have no idea how wonderful it is to know that they were able to make it to life. And you pray, you pray that their life is not stuffed up, snuffed out before they can be born. And now there are children. And my little girl, from the moment she was born, she loved her daddy. I can't explain it. I can't, I, I can't. There was something that happened when they put that little girl in my arms. I, 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 could, I would rush home from work. And when I would enter the house, and she would hear my voice, that little bassinet would just start shaking. Because she loved her daddy, and she does to this day. She's got four of her own. Life is what God made us for. That is what America stands for. You do away with that, and you've done away with America. And ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know who to vote for, one party is committed. Why are they screaming and yelling at, at Kavanaugh? You can talk about all you want. It's because death. Versus life. Satan's plan for your life is death. Satan wants you financially dead. He wants you emotionally dead. He wants your relationships between your, your spouse and your children dead. He wants, he wants you emotionally dead. He wants you mentally dead. He wants you spiritually dead. He wants you physically dead. All thoughts of suicide come from Satan. But I am come that you might have life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that hath the Son hath life. And our founders based this country upon life, and that fight is still going on, and we're going to win. Very reliable, and it's across the country, and I, I just, a lot of times you don't know where to, you know, where to, which voter guide, you didn't hear from you, whatever group gives it to you, ivoterguide.com. Go ahead. This question is for Bob McEwen. I'm Suzanne Gallagher, and I head up an organization uh, called Parents' Rights in Education. And we are very concerned about what's being taught in our public schools. There is one group that I want to ask you about, in particular because you mentioned that you are speaking in um, Eastern, Eastern Bloc countries. What we're noticing is that the Romanian communities, the Russian communities, all of these immigrants who come into our country uh, now the second generation are raising their own children and they are going to our schools and they are fired up. I'm telling you, they are, they're, they're strong Christians and they do not like what they're seeing in the public schools. And up until now, uh, as a candidate, I noticed those individuals were very reticent to get involved in the process in our country. Those new citizens that have immigrated here legally. They're, but now they are excited because they are so angry about what's happening in the public schools. They are speaking out at school board meetings. They do not like the agenda that's taking place in the, the public schools. And I'm wondering if you're seeing that in your relationship with uh, Mr. Wong. Well, that, that, that raises the opportunity to say this. 
Most people do not know who's on the school board. The votes vote are very, very small. In most districts, three to 500 votes will give you a seat on a school board. That means your church, you get two churches in a row, you can do it. But we don't know or care. You know who does know or care? Exactly the people that you mentioned. And so they get their friends, and, and, and this woman is teaching in this school, so her husband runs for the school board in there, and then that person runs for the school board over here, and it's a, it's a closed loop because you and I let it happen. And, and just confidentially among us girls, Christians love to pray, but they don't like to work a lot of times. And as a candidate, you know that you're they're going to, when it really matters, why didn't you show up? You know that this Thursday night, this was the meeting in which this ball team was playing that team. 80% of the people in the county are going to be there over an hour and a half period. We can get everybody in the county. You didn't show up, but you didn't come. Well, we had an Awana meeting, you know, and there was an emergency. And, and there's always some important thing that they have to, they got to recognize for the Lord. Who's the sovereign in America? God holds the sovereign accountable. Who's the sovereign in America? It's you and me. We are responsible for this country. We will stand before God and give account for what we allow to happen on our watch. And Satan loves to convince you that it's noble to be involved in this over here while he's stealing everything over there. And we, need, we should own every school board. We could do it with men of effort. I was walking down the street in my hometown, and I ran into the county chair, and I said, uh, how are we doing on, on the city council races? Oh, not very good. Uh, so well, how, how are we going to win? I don't, I don't think we're going to win any of them. Uh, well, what are we going to do? I don't know we're not going to win anything. Said, well, that's, that's a wonderful program. I, I like that. So uh, th there was, they just formed a young Republican group in the high school. And so they had a dozen kids. And my wife and I were newlyweds. And so I, I got a copy of the map of my hometown. And there are four wards. And there's a city councilman from each ward, and there are three at large running the whole city. So I, I printed cards for our Republican candidates in the ward plus the at large, and put the four in each one of the square, put on the floor, and invited the folks over to the house. We had pizza and things. And I said, now nah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take these, these four cards, and I want you to walk door to door. You can cover the whole thing in a night, but I want you to do that twice between now and election day, knock on every door, give them the four cards, and ask them they vote for those people. And whoever wins, that person's going to get a steak dinner. So they all take off and do it. Now, you want to know how many city council seats we won? Out of seven? All seven. It's, it, it, politics is not complicated. It's simple, but it takes work. And the people that want to steal our country are willing to commit to it. You and I aren't. It doesn't take rocket science. It just takes a little bit of effort. We get a list of people in our very seat, and we can take this country back in New York minute. I've been involved now for nearly two years in picketing and praying in front of the Planned Parenthood in downtown Portland on Martin Luther King and the uh, surgical abortion money in Portland. And it's a wonderful place to go and toughen up. Um, it's a really good, honorable group who are there for life. 40 days for life, if you're not familiar with that, happens two times a year. We're in the middle of the fall project, and I was just wondering um, if you had anything to add about those two. Yeah, I would say, and thank you for doing that. I, I, I've done that a fair amount, and it's, it's hard duty, uh, standing outside, and, and you get a lot of rejection, a lot of prayers. I've seen some saves, though, and that's good. Uh, there's a girl who was uh, part of the movement in D.C., and she had, I think she's up to 14 saves this year. I said, what's the secret? If you're standing outside an abortion clinic, what's getting them to come back out? And she said, the number one thing is you tell them it's not too late. Because they've got their decision made, they, their boyfriend wants this, and they think they, they're walking in and they're determined, and they say it's not too late is what she has found brings them back more than, than anything else. By the way, I also wrote about it, I do have a few books, uh, a few books, if anybody wants any, we'll have them in the back afterwards, hopefully. But, but uh, what I suggested in one of my books was uh, give them, you know, they're, they're worried about uh, the baby is a problem, you know, to them. It's a problem, it's not right, I'm embarrassed, my family, my, you know, I don't know the idea, what I want to do. And, and if you turn the problem into uh, something else, and what I did is, is I suggested people put little sleepers, like little baby sleepers. You know the kind of baby clothes that you look at and you just say, aw, that's, aw, that's cute. 
And I said, take, take those and, and give those out at the abortion mills as they're going in. And I had a lady call me. I was, I was a national director at the Center for Reclaiming America at the time. I'll never forget the call. She called me up. She said she gave away three baby outfits that day. And uh, two of them came back uh, with, with, a, with a, yes, I choose life. Because suddenly they're holding this little baby item, this baby outfit, and they're picturing their baby in it. No longer is this a problem, a glob of cells like they're telling them on the inside. They're seeing it as a child, and that changes their perspective. And so to be there to help, it's not too late. Here's the options. But 40 Days for Life is a great organization. Planned Parenthood, you want me to comment on that? They're a terrible organization. And uh, I, mean, I tell people that if you're under uh, 45 years old, I, I tell people, what, Planned Parenthood's first plan for your life was abortion. Why in the world would you listen to them now? And why in the world would we allow the funding, why a dime to go to that atrocious organization, which is racist at its core, uh, and evil beyond words. And so uh, I guess that's the message. I say let's put them out of business, pass HR 490, the heartbeat bill. Follow up. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's atrocious what, what they're doing. And Bob, maybe you want to talk about this too? I actually would. A lot of people don't know what Planned Parenthood does. They think it's noble and it helps the poor ladies and all that sort of thing. Let me tell you what Planned Parenthood does. Planned Parenthood devises efforts to kill babies. That is all that it does. That's all that it does. And, and there are about 97% of all the counties in America, you're not allowed to perform abortions. And so there are no abortion clinics. Uh, so what Planned Parenthood does is it has a handful of these abortionists, and it flies them around the country, and they come in and perform all of those abortions, and they make a lot of money doing it. That's all that they do. I, I, I want to emphasize that. A while back, they, be, they began to understand that it would be politically advantageous to say that they gave mammograms. Until finally, after about a dozen years, a member of Congress had the president of Planned Parenthood said, do you perform, do you perform uh, mammograms? And after him hauling around and talking about everything in the world, they directly, and the answer is no. They don't do any of that. They say, well, that's just one of the things that they do. What they've done is that they perform only abortions. But to do an abortion, you have to take the blood pressure, and you have to put on a band-aid, and you have to have anesthesia, and you have to put on a gown, and, you have to, and so they have a list of about 40 things they do. They said only one of those is abortion. They hire the entire thing as an abortion project, but they do it for the people that are ignorant of it, number one. So you understand that's all they do. Now, how do they increase business? They give awards to abortion clinic operators who are able to increase the number of abortions that they get. And the way that they do it is that they get into the schools and they teach the kids all of the things that, as adults, that you and I would not say publicly at all. Only they say it over and over and over to break down the natural modesty that's built into kids and that God put inside of it. And so then they, they'll make these girls put, put we used to call rubbers, they, they, they put, put uh, prophylactics on, on these bananas and, and on cucumbers and things in front of the, and they're, they're doing this, little fifth graders, to break down the modesty. Now once you've learned how to do that, and you've done it, and you've laughed, and you're, then the next step is that you begin to engage in promiscuous sex. And when you engage in promiscuous sex, you then have pregnancies. And you have pregnancies, who gave you the prophylactic in the first place, and so the degree to which they're able to get into your schools is the degree to which they're able to increase pregnancies, to increase the abortions, that they make more money, and they get awards for how many increases they've had to step up. And they're using your children to do it, and they, and they stand up there and act like it's noble, and there is nothing more evil than teaching, than stealing the, 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 the dignity of a little girl, of these little kids, and then scarring them for life. And the reason that one couple in five in America cannot conceive is because of the scars and damage that's been going on from that in many, many, many cases. So that's what Planned Parenthood is, and, and they make money hand over fist. Their last year, their carryover was $136 million. Now, they don't need any money from us. Why do they get money out of the, out of the Congress? Because Satan 
wants you to be a part of the program. He wants it. To, Abraham Lincoln wrote in, 19, in 1858 about why it, you couldn't have some states free and some states not. Because when you oppose slavery, the, the, the letters that went into the South saying you opposed slavery was a violation of the law, therefore they were able to open the letters. He said, it, it, as long as there is evil, it, it expands and envelops all of us. Okay, that was on slavery. It's the same way on abortion. As long as we say, we have to be a part of it, and they want us to pay our tax dollars to do it. And you know who's opposed to it? The Republican Party is opposed to it. But it's important to understand the wife of the people in leadership, like Boehner and Pelosi and and Paul Ryan, all of whom, dear, the boy, devout Catholics, that tell, will tell you straight up how strongly they are opposed to abortion, but brother, when it comes to funding, they keep sticking it in there every single time, every single time. And that's why we need a new Speaker of the House. We need to take control. We're this far from doing it, and we're going to finally going to, going to put a stop to this. And we're in, that's why, that's why Satan's sticking and screaming so much, because we're, we're on the cusp of a victory. But I, I cannot overemphasize there's nothing more evil. There's nothing that went on at, at Auschwitz or her Bergen Wall or anyplace else more evil than what Planned Parenthood does every day in America. By the way, Jim Jordan would make an excellent speaker. Don't you think? He let me come. I thought your speech was wonderful. Uh, and I, I could quote some of it after I leave. But I <coughs> Googled CNP. And because I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know what it was. Can you explain what it is? All right. Uh, I have no idea what Google would say, but I can sure it's probably the opposite of what the truth is. So therefore, uh, I'll just tell you very simply that uh, there is there is a uh, an establishment that wants power, and uh, the Republicans. Uh, there have only been three times that the Republican Party was overwhelmed by the voters. One was in 1964. The other was in 1980. The other was 2016. In 1980, we defeated the establishment, and uh, Ronald Reagan was the nominee, and that night they decided they would take George Bush as the representative of the establishment. And during the campaign, when they went after Reagan, as they did, uh, George Bush did not, was not really, he, he behaved like, like uh, Mitch McConnell did in the last campaign. You can't point to anything that he did wrong, but he sure didn't bust a gut trying to defend the president. And so a bunch of us got George Bush in a room about October that year and said we were fed up with him dodging bullets and not coming to the defense of our candidate. And uh, he, he said to some folks, he said, well, why don't you trust me? And one of the guys said, well, you remember the Council on Foreign Relations and the, and the Trilateral Commission and all these left-wing groups? And he shouted back at us. He said, he said, well, you conservatives don't have anything like that. You know, we, all, we all looked at each other. He's right about yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in March of, 18, of 1981, basically the finance committee of, of Ronald Reagan's campaign and a handful of us conservatives formed a thing called the Council for National Policy. It's about 400 people. It's the heads of conservative organizations, the president of Heritage Foundation, the president of the National Rifle Association, Phyllis Schlafly with, with uh, Eagle Forum, et cetera, about 200 of those and about 200 businessmen, Rich DeVos and, and Foster Freeze and, and people, businessmen such as, such as Ames. And we meet three times a year for the purpose of getting conservative organizations to work together. And, and only we can do that because the thing that keeps them apart is money, finances. And so the American Enterprise Institute is reluctant to work together with Heritage Foundation because they don't want their contributors to cross-pollinate and see what they're doing. So they, everybody does good things, but somebody needs to get them in a room and say, now look, we all need to work together for that. So CMP is a, is a membership organization. We don't raise money. We tell people, you give us $100,000, we'll give it back to you. It, 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 it's a conservative leadership organization. We three times a year, and we say to these folks, we need to do this, we need to do that. And fortunately, Liz and I joined the third meeting. These three times a year, we joined the third meeting about five years ago. I became executive director. Worked very, very closely with the president because the White House is supposed to do this, but that White House has not figured out how to do this. Ninety percent of every good thing that's come out of this White House has been done by one person. And been done by the Justice Department or Congress or anybody else. This guy, and, but we're trying to help him. He's getting better all the time. So that's basically what CNB does. It, it, it tells Grover Norquist with the, with the Americans for Tax Reform, I know you don't care who's on the Supreme Court, but the NRA does. 
And when you want your tax bill come November, you'll wish the NRA was with you. So you need to help us get horses on the board, and then we'll go down here and there's only one person can do that, and that's me. And Google doesn't describe it like that. <laughs> I'm, scared, I'm scared to read it. <laughs> Color me surprised. Yeah. Do we have another question? My, my question is, I'm concerned about my grandchildren. Uh, I know that evil is not going to stop when we put them out of power. They, get, they become very violent. Uh, and what I'm concerned about is what's going on in Washington, D.C. now, just with the Kavanaugh hearing and stuff like that. Uh, but they're also interrupting our politicians when they're eating dinner. They're, they're becoming more violent. Are you seeing that also? Well, let's just look at it. I love history because I love America. And there were times when we had, we had marches down the streets for communists. And we had communist candidates that were running. And, and there, there were times when America was in severe trouble. From 1929 to 1995, that's 70 years. That's a third of the history of the United States. Republicans didn't share a single committee, didn't pass a bill, didn't pass a budget, for a third of the history, except for 48 months. That's what I grew up in. I was for 24 years, elected office, state house, and state congress, never chaired a committee, never did, but we were in the minority. The fight is significant, but we hold 69 of the 99 house seats. Now, there would be 100 because every state has two, except Nebraska has only got one. So it's 99. Of the 99 house seat, uh, state house chambers, we control 69. Nobody's ever done that in the history of the United States. We control both the House and the Senate. Ronald Reagan never had that. Eisenhower never had that. Nixon never had that. We now have both houses and the president. We're going to take over the Congress. We have 34 of the 50 governorships. Nobody has ever had that many. So it's important that we not become weary in well-doing. That, that in the battle, that it's significant, but for a long, long time, we were losing over and over and over. And yeah, it happens to be that we're actually winning over and over and over. Is there another question? Here, here. Do you have a position on this convention of states where they're going to talk about the Constitution? My position on that is, as soon as we get Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and Benjamin Franklin, I think we should have another convention. Until that time comes, I'm opposed to it. As am I. Um, I wanted to ask, in Oregon, almost all of the um, abortions are funded by the state. Uh, without a means test, you can go on to Medicaid for one day, have your abortion, and then go back off of Medicaid again. And so our taxpayers pay almost all of our abortions. And we've been trying for years to get this initiative on the ballot to stop the taxpayer funding of abortion. And after many years of working on it, it's finally on the ballot for November here in Oregon. So I was wondering, have you heard of any groups that want to come out and help us with the messaging to get this passed now that we finally have it on the ballot? I don't, but you know what, I'll, I'll put the word out and see if you guys, you guys need some help. What is it? Issue? 105. 105? Yeah, yeah, I'll go by and stop it and, and see if we can connect. Maybe some CFP Absolutely. people can help us. Absolutely. Huh? The mind cannot absorb more than the seat can endure, so I don't want to wear my, wear out my 106. mind. 106! 106, okay, 106, there you go. By the way, the world descended on South Dakota when they were working, in, and I was one of them, I was there helping the South Dakota, and everybody came, I did a radio show in South Dakota, six South Dakota stations every day for that campaign. In fact, I was there and I said, uh, uh, this is South Dakota, and the killing stops here, and I came back again, and they handed bumper stickers. So I, I think that, that what we need is for you to be crying out for help and saying, come and, and help us defund this. Uh, because have you done any polling? Do we know how close it is, or do we know? I'll, I'll stop by the booth and talk to you. But they said they'd let them come in and speak to them, and so you could ask them that when they come in and do their elevators. I'd be happy to come out and, 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 uh, and, and help in any way I can. Uh, oh, that would be so wonderful. Yeah, I'll stop by and, and see if we can get some, some others connected. I just wanted to, did you, did, Marilyn, do you have a question? I just wanted to say the leaders are here today at the camp. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
one thing I wanted to mention that I saw a video when we were back at the UC. I don't know if you got it, but I got it. Maybe under duress, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, and I have to describe it to you. If you take this, I have this video, and if we, if we take this to the video and, and distribute it to our House and Senate, and if we distribute it to any woman who is thinking about being liberal because she's pro-abortion, I think that they would change their minds very rapidly. I'm going to describe it, but it's not a pleasant thing to describe. Um, I have studied to be a, a medical doctor. I didn't finish my last year. That's okay. And I'm glad I didn't do that, by the way. But when you talk about this kind of stuff, it's very, very unpleasant. But I, the video is a doctor who's done over 1,200 abortions. And he goes into the, with the, he does a graphic of it, how it's done. And the way it's done is he goes in and describes the process and cuts a leg off and takes it out. And cuts another leg off and takes it out. And cuts another one and takes it out. And cuts this arm off and takes it out. And he pulls the parts out one at a time. And then he goes in and he crushes the skull. Now, when a, ch when a young lady thinking about an abortion uh, that sort, that's the end of it, what I've seen in a couple of instances, where they change their mind. And I think that this, if it were distributed to members of the House and the Senate, especially Democrats, I think they would change their mind on an abortion along. All right. And I'd like to see mass produce it. We're ca my, my company, we're capable of mass producing thousands of discs for marketing purposes. And if it were distributed in such a way, I think we'd make Oregon a heartbeat, you know, heartbeat bill. And, you know, I want to know what you think of that. So anyway, but you haven't seen this, and I have. No, so. but, and I've seen many like it, but but I don't know. I'm just sitting here thinking about we don't have to distribute DVDs to That's people right. now. We can just put it on, you know, all the different social media, the Instagrams and the Twitter and the and Facebooks and, and all, as long as they don't censor you and all of that. Don't look at that. Nick, look, I don't want to see that. Don't but you know, you can you, you can target where this stuff's going, and I'm thinking about issue 106. I'm thinking about. Getting those people in the middle, you can look and see by what they what they're associated with. If they're something like Planned Parenthood and involved in it, you know, they, we've been we've been hearing for years get government out of the abortion, get, get government out of this this issue. Well, that's what this issue does. It gets government out of this issue. Hey, how about the right to choose how your tax dollar pays or tax dollars are spent? I mean, we could use some of their their slogans against them, and I think the way to do it is to get these. We can get short videos, and then you can target where they go. Oregon voters. You get, you get all our people with our red meat, give them all that message, and then you get some of those nuanced things that go to the middle of the road, folks. Um, and then I always tell the Democrats, be sure to come out and vote on Wednesday, rather than Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for another question? Okay. Well, I heard that the Planned Parenthood and the Girl Scouts were together when you buy Girl Scout cookies. Yeah. You, uh, yeah. And so now they have the girls that are in the Boy Scouts. By the way, giving up Girl Scout cookies is one of the hardest activist things I ever had to do, but I did do it. Um, but but it's, it's they're horrendous. It, it, the, the Girl Scouts they are pushing the lesbian agenda, they're pushing the abortion agenda, and, and now with what's happening. I, I had a movie, and, uh, and I have a few with me. One is going to go to the parents' rights groups that I talked to. This is for you guys. This one's for you. Um, and, and here's the thing to remember. Uh, in the battle between darkness and light, light wins. It explains all the stuff about the transgender movement and all the LGBTQRSTUV movement and, and all the rest that's going on. And, and here's the deal. We cannot give up on the issue of marriage either. Um, there's an issue. I was meeting with Congressman Louis Gohmert uh, two weeks ago, and he's in this movie, and he reminded me of one of the things that's in it. And it, it, I didn't know this, but I had a, a guest on, Joe Nicolosi, I think was the guy I had on the radio show when I was doing it at the time. And he said to me, uh, Janet, do you know any other time in our history of the world, any other time in history where men were given in marriage to men and women were given in marriage to women? And, it, and I said, I don't know, Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon, you know, Greece, and Rome was pretty bad. He said, no, no, according to the Jewish rabbinical writings in the Babylonian Talmud, only one other time, if these Jewish rabbinical writings, a thousand years before Christ, if these writings are true, 
There was only one other time in our history where homosexual marriage was practiced. And he says, do you know what it was? It was during the days of Noah. And if this is true, if these writings are correct, then you know what it says in Matthew. That in fact we are distinctly, uniquely in the place like it was during the days of Noah. You know the verse, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. And the Son of Man returns, depending on which version you read. So marriage matters to God. And it seems as though wherever I go, all of Christendom has given up on marriage. And I'm telling you, we cannot give up on marriage. And the issue of marriage, unlike what John Kasich said, a Burgefell settled marriage. It no, no more settled marriage than Dred Scott settled abortion, or Ro settled slavery, or Roe versus Wade settled abortion. We, we can't give up because our liberties are intertwined with this issue. And we've got to take it back too. And that's one of the issues that's at stake in this court. If you want to, if you want a primer on this, it's, there's got a, uh, not only a hundred minutes of the movie, but there's extra features that deal with the Boy Scouts specifically, um, and deal with groups like the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Any, by the way, if anybody here is in that list on a hate list, um, uh, I want to talk to you afterwards because we're suing them. Uh, so yeah, talk to me. Make sure you do. Anybody else on SPLC hate list? Y'all need to step it up, and you're not doing enough to be targeted, and I kind of wonder what kind of group is this. Step it up. Just kidding. We'll talk. We're moving on. Thanks, Abe. God bless you. All right. All right. And I'm very thankful for the people. Corbin, would you come up here, sir? Corbin. Corbin or Christian University.